Yeah, just meeting you. Okay. Coding. So, um, those of you who have taken classes with me, I'm gonna, you know, you've probably done this before, but if everybody can put both feet on the floor, close your eyes, and breathe out three times. with in-breaths between, of course. See yourself in a room. In the center of the room, there's a box full of balloons already blown up. Pick up a balloon of a color you really like. Take the balloon to the window or the door. If it is not open, open the door or the window and allow yourself to be swept up, flown up by the balloon, floating up in the sky until you see a place you really like. When you find that place that you really like, give the balloon string a little tug and land at that place that you like. Notice what time of day it is. Feel the air on your skin. Enjoy being here. Take a deep breath. And open your eyes. Anybody would like to tell us where they landed? Yes. Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu, okay, which I, I haven't been, but I believe it's on the top I've of the mountain. I've never been, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but you've just been there now. Yeah, because I want to be there. So Quick trip. <laughs> <laughs> Very cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> often. Awesome. Great discount. <laughs> um, so I'm assuming it's, it's the top of a mountain, basically. Yeah. Okay, what time of day? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, so light. Oh. Anyone else? The pyramids, maybe? Yeah? Beach. Beach. Oh, <laughs> Where did you go to? A beach. A beach. Okay. And, hi. And what? Sunset. 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 Okay. Yeah. Very, very, a very typical kind of um, description. And you went to? Beachy Head. Down on the south coast. Okay. Sorry, yeah. yeah. I, I have It's been kind there. of hills that go down to, with the big, um, the cliffs of Dover type scenery. Gotcha. And what time of day? Midday. So okay. bright sunshine. Okay. Yes. Um, at the top of the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. At the top of the Himalayas, did you say? Okay. And sunrise. Okay. So notice, every single person lands in a place where there's a lot of space. There is light. Okay. I'm going to add to it. There. This. That does not come from that imagery. But that imagery tells you that healing requires space and light. Without space, without light, you know, like congested darkness is not a place of healing. Okay? A place you really like. Some people will say, I landed at this lovely restaurant in Paris where I met my husband, blah, blah. Yeah, it's, it's a dark, narrow place, blah, 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 but there's a reason. Um, but generally speaking, we're seeking space, we're seeking light. Okay, and the other prerequisite for healing is knowledge of new possibilities, which is really the same as space, meaning it's not stuck here. Anything can happen. Okay, um, so I, you know, I, this is sort of not exactly a play of words because these are two different shens. Okay, the shen of the body you can see that actually, you know, I very rarely put the pinion things. It's hard for me to, to in, in typing, to, to put those accents on, but they're different. Shen and shen, they're, they're different shens, but the, you know, the, it's a little bit of a play on words, okay? And so this whole class is about how do we use the body to treat the mind? How does the mind reflect in the body, okay? But there's still, we have to consider that there's always, we're always seeking to provide space and light, okay? So, uh, just to speak a little bit about the mind. Oh, like <coughs> so, one thing when we're working with people's minds, but really with anything, because we're always working with the mind, even when we're purely working with the body, is that there's, there's a sort of principle the mind is always larger in potential 
than any particular thing. Okay, so um, you want to make the mind greater than the problem. So, um, for example, if you take um, a teaspoon of salt and put it in a glass of water, the glass of water is very salty, you don't want to drink it. But if you put that teaspoon in the lake, at the time when people could drink out of lakes, <laughs> maybe not now, then you don't taste the, you don't taste the salt. Okay? So the mind is always like that. The mind can, you know, doesn't have to be the cup, it can be, become the lake. So when, if you were, you know, working with anxiety, worry, things of that nature, which is a big, you know, a big part of nervous system disorders or shin disturbance, how can I make the mind larger? So I can see from a larger perspective. And so I'm just a little bit too philosophical, you know, really. Have it in notes. Um, so the character Shen itself, okay, it's on the left part you get, I, I know it looks different, the thing that comes from heaven, but when you when it becomes instead of a character, it becomes um, you know part of a larger character gets translated into this. So this is coming down from heaven. Okay? Something that came down from heaven or an amen if you look it up in the dictionary. And this part is to extend. Okay? Now, I get that for most people, this looks to you just like center with an extra line. But that's not where it comes from. Etymologically, these two characters, oops, sorry, so this is center. Okay. These two characters have nothing to do with each other. They look exactly the same with an extra stroke. They're not related. The character to extend comes from two hands coming together. Extending, you know, it's just think of like uh, squeezing the, the toothpaste in the tube. <laughs> okay, you're squeezing, extending. Okay, and what that tells you is that the shen, oops, sorry. Okay, so it tells you that the shen, need, the shen needs to be extended. If something is extending, it's going from one place to another. It needs to connect. Okay, if you, you if you extending something, you can. If I just take, if this was an elastic, if I just take it, I'm not extending it. I'm just taking it. I have to anchor it. I have to put it here and extend it towards somewhere, okay? It has to be, number one, anchored, and it has to connect to something. So the Shen has to connect. It, 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 it um, by nature, wants to connect, okay? That it, it's its nature. Um, so the, the more narrow it connects, the more problematic it's gonna be, because it also wants to extend, <laughs> okay? So the, we're always gonna look at, <coughs> at, at this, um, how is, is the Shen connecting? So notice that even in TCM, you do not have deficiency of Shen. I've never heard of that term. I mean, maybe you, maybe this is a new term that's out there. You, you never hear, you know, because you have Qi deficiency, um, but you, you know, blood deficiency, but there's no Shen deficiency, right? Okay. And the Shen, well, none of them really have excess. You don't have excess of blood. Or what you have is like, say, heat in the blood you know, things like that. So the Shen doesn't have an excess either. What the Shen has is a misdirection. Or the Shen is blocked, it's not unable to connect. So these, you know, they have terms like, oh, you have phlegm um, blocking the, 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 the portals or something like that, right? Yeah. Orifices or something, you know, whatever, whatever the, the expression is. <laughs> so the Shen is unable to move or connect, or they say the Shen is not Rooted, it doesn't have it's it's it, there's not enough blood. So the other big category of shen disturbances is basically a blood deficient category. Okay, if you look, you know, on, on on herbs, you get either the ones that push the shen push down like the heavy stones. You get the opening of the um, uh, of the phlegm, the, the and then you get the 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 more com the most common category is the blood nourishing category. Okay, so. That's kind of like how generally <coughs> people look at Shen disturbances. Interestingly enough, in uh, TCM, th there is going to be a very large uh, association of Shen and liver. OK? 
Okay, and then you can say, oh yes, it's the hun, it's the blah blah, whatever, whatever. But for me, it's not so much about the liver as a physical organ. For me, it's about um, the ability to move up and down, which is an ability of the liver. Okay, so I'm not that interested in treating the liver in uh, in psycho in psycho emotional issues, generally speaking, uh, which is a big departure. Um, you know, for, for you it would be a big departure from TCM. So for example, I had a woman two weeks ago um, and she came and she, she comes for a knee problem but she had a big to-do at her job. Um, and um, she, was, she, was, um, she, was, she was hoping to get fired and she wasn't. <laughs> so, well, well, you can collect, you know, you get a package or whatever. And she, she, you know, she was like, now they want me to stay and they give me a different job that I really hate and blah, blah, blah. And, and she's, I have a, you know, she's like, it's just this terrible headache, which, you know, like this typical thing that in TCM they will go, oh, liver too, <laughs> kind of thing. And, but I did the next treatment you're going to see, which is coordinating up and down, nothing to do with liver, okay? And she's, oh, my headache is gone. You know, her headache was clearly, she's angry, you know, because she's being led to believe, look, you're going to get this lovely package, you're going to pay you X amount of months, everything's going to be happy, and I'm going to open a restaurant, by the way, <laughs> on the money you pay me, and now it's like it's all done. <laughs> so, um, so I know you've seen this before, and I know people kind of have a difficulty with this to understand why I'm putting this in. Um, so it serves two purposes, okay? I want to show you how you create things <coughs> on your own. Okay, I'm showing you my process of deriving at a protocol. Okay, so it relates to this extending, extending me coming from the side and two hands coming and squeezing. Okay, and the importance of relating up and down. So you know there's a phrase in Chinese medicine that says, the dirty yin goes down, the clear yang moves up. That that's, and that's kind of like, uh, it, it's one of these basic things before anything else happens. If this doesn't happen, nothing else happens in the body. Why? Because the body, the human, is between heaven and earth. Okay, we are mediators of yin yang. We are mediators of this movement of going up and down. Both need to happen. A downward push needs to happen and an upward movement has to happen. Otherwise, what's going to happen? You're going to be like this. And you're just going to sink. Which means, and this applies to everything you do, okay, is all your organs are basically squished together. Now, you can call it um, liver cheek congestion if you want, or you can call it something else. But, you know, if you're trying to go back to basic, what it doesn't have is it doesn't have a down and it doesn't have an up as a result. And then there's space. The organs need space. You need space. An elementary uh, component of healing is space. Okay, you've got to give it space between heaven and earth. We have to create that space. So this this comes. I'm showing you how I arrive at a protocol given my interest. Okay, so this is a phrase from the Heart Sutra. Okay, it has nothing to do with Chinese medicine officially, because Chinese medicine supposedly is a Taoist medicine, it's not a Buddhist medicine. Okay? And the phrase basically says, it's the, Aval um, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, which is Guan Yin. Okay? She sheds light on the five skandhas, meaning on her mind and body, and finds them equally empty. Okay? After this understanding, as a result of this understanding, she overcomes all ill-being. Okay? So, two things. So, to shed light, the expression is zhao jian. Zhao, this is to illuminate something, to, um, to shine light on, on it. Okay, that's zhao. Okay, it tells us that to resolve our difficulties, to resolve ill-being, we have to shed light on things. That's basically what, what, what it's saying. Okay, there is a zhao in the body, okay? And it's called Jiao uh, Hai, kidney six. Okay, there's only there's only one Jiao in the body. Something to do with kidney. I, I'm starting to sort of go. Is there something in kidney six that relates to my ability to overcome ill-being? But before I do that, I have to ask myself, how is ill-being being expressed? Ill-being is is being expressed as ku, which is bitter. 
Okay, so you have like, for example, kushen, sephora, the bitter herb, the bitter root, and uh, to be distressed. Now, the way they're expressed, this character, ku, above it is, this is a grass, this character in the top, and this is like a tent. It's a grass that's been around 10 times, that's why it's bitter. It's been around so long, like, you know, it's, it's the end of autumn, and it's withering, and it has no juice in it anymore. Therefore, it's bitter. Okay, so th that, that's what that word means. And uh, distress, it's literally like a person crouching. You can see, like, this is distress, okay? So there's, it tells us that this withering, ill-being, has to do with withering. There's no juice, and there's no upright, okay? So we're starting with, with that. And then I'm looking at something that does come from Chinese medicine, which is Ling Shu chapter 33. Um, and it talks about the four oceans. You probably have heard, you know, there's the ocean of uh, the blood, and the ocean of the qi, and the ocean of the grain, and the ocean of the marrow. And the ocean of the marrow, if there's a surplus of marrow, it's actually a good thing. Unlike if there's a surplus of the others, it's not, it creates problematics. And what it creates is qing ji jiong lu li, meaning, um, Easefulness, lightness, not light, like light, but light, uh, fluffy, okay? Sturdiness, and lots of strength, okay? And that character, Qing, okay, which is, you know, the, on the left you have a, a cart, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like a car, and on the right you have a river. So it's something that moves smoothly along the river, <coughs> that's easefulness. And then we have something called that. There's um, something called um, mental formations in Buddhist jargon. Okay, so to, just to show you, I'm taking things from a, something that does not belong in Chinese medicine. Okay, Buddhism is not part of Chinese medicine. So when we talk about mental formations, they ex they are not part of Chinese medicine. They're part of a different school of thought. And we have something called easefulness or lightfulness. Oh, to to be light. Okay, and that's um, so. You, you want to have that because the opposite of it is when you're not light and everything. So, and that's called Ching An, the same character. Okay. Interesting enough, we're starting from extending. We're all, we're all going to get back to what does it mean to extend because extend relates to the Shen. Okay, the Shen needs to extend. Don't lose that thought. It's, it, it's hard because, no, especially, you know, we're not Chinese speakers. We get lost in all this. Okay, what happened here? Okay, keep remembering. Where it, this is all about the Shen, about extending. The opposite of change, the opposite of easefulness and lightness can be, so if I say easeful, I'm easeful. In English, what are you going to say the opposite of easeful is? Chances are you'll say restlessness, okay? That's the, you know, and that exists in almost, it's, it's an, op, it's by, <coughs> the opposite of easeful tends to be, I've tried it in different countries, it tends to be described in the negative, in the opposition. It uh, tends not to have a word of its own, okay? So restlessness, okay? So you can express it as no peace in Chinese also, or technically speaking, when, you, when I'm looking at it in a Buddhist context, the opposite of the mental formation of Qing An is Jiao Jiu. Okay, that's restlessness in, in kind of more technical jargon. Okay, Jiao is to drop. You lose something. You dropped it. And what did you, what did you lose? You lose your uprightness. Okay. That's the, sorry, I'm pointing at the computer as if you can see it. <laughs> Jiao is to drop something and this is to lift. Now, do you see these two things here? This is like those two hands that are coming from the side, the same thing to extend. It's a much more complex character, but general, basically it, is, it comes from you lost your extension. Okay, so if I want to create ease in my body, it means I cannot drop my extension, okay? If I want to have ease in myself, and I come like this, it's obvious I'm not going to have ease, because it's a little hard even to just move when everything is dropping down, okay? So you've got to create some fluffiness, 
Okay, that's the whole point of this. Now, as a result of this, I'm not sure. If, okay. Oh, I know what happened there. Yes, there, there was a slide. There's a slide that's hidden, unfortunately, in this. Um, <coughs> So because kidney six has that character Zhao to illuminate, okay, I started to look what can happen with kidney six. Does kidney six do anything? And then I'm looking at does it start extending? So let's stand up and let's act, let's see if kidney six does anything. Okay? So I know many of you have done this before. Yes, you have to figure out if it's actually picking up anything. Right? Who knows what it picked up before? Okay, so kidney six is basically between your heel, this is the heel, and this is the ankle bone. They're two different bones, right? We know that. Okay, so kidney six is between the two. I'm going to ask you to send the heel down, push the heel down, but lift the ankle bone up. Now, what's going to happen for most of us when we do that, if I send the heel down, I'm going to kind of throw my, my whole foot goes in, and then when I try and lift the ankle bone away from it, I'm going to try and be, I'm going to start walking on my bladder channel, like this, okay, because I'm lifting my, my, resist that, keep spleen three on the ground, and see if you can lift Send the heel down, spleen three down, and lift the ankle bone away from it, even though it doesn't lift much in space. Chances are you feel something between your thighs, correct? Okay, good. Okay, now take that something between the thighs. Keep, keep that action in the heel and the ankle bone. It's kind of subtle. And see if you can continue that action, at least in your mind's eye, in to, to where bring the front of the spine up. Not the spine itself necessarily, but just in front of the spine, there's a, as if there's a straw between your thighs and you're like sucking it up. And for some of you, it may come all the way to the throat. Most of you will get stuck somewhere around in the spine. It's not, it's not so easy to get it all the way up. Okay? Do you feel that? Yes? Okay. The main thing is that I want you to feel at least the inner thigh. The rest is a little bit more in the mind. Okay. You can let go. So I do a fair amount of these because I, I, for me it's very important that you, you, we have in the agriculture world, we have this understanding that some people in the past invented some system, okay, and we're assuming that they're correct. But we have to prove it in our, in our culture and in our bodies. And of course, not everything I can do in my body. Okay, if every single human body is going to be slightly different. So somebody 2,500 years ago thought of something and they could produce it in their body. And, and you know, some of these things maybe they couldn't produce in their body, but they were, oh, that mistress that I had five years ago, she was very cute, I'll name this point after her. How do we know how they made points? Okay. No, I mean, I'm serious. It's, it's, we don't know, but we have to keep trying to find out what are the, if they really left a secret, supposedly, they have to become my secret, or not secret, they have, it has to become part of me. Otherwise, it, it's always the ancient secret from 2,500 years ago. It's like, how do you apply this? You know, it, it has to become part of you, and it has to become part of you by, yes? Um, not so long ago, I had a young lady come to see me who got, uh, she was a singer, mm -hmm. and she had problems just before her period, her voice would go, and she could recognise the voice was going. Um, and I think there were other issues, so I actually treated her in TCM. Although I do Japanese, mm -hmm. predominantly I do TCM. Yeah. Um, so I think I might have done heart uh, five, but I did kidney six. Mm. Kidney six for the throat. Right. Okay, that's why I did it. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, uh, when I finished, I took the needles out, she stood up. She said, I feel straighter. And in, 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 instantly, my mind went to Japanese then. And I thought, yes, I know why you've stood up. Because it doesn't actually say in TCM books. But she, had, she was the first person ever, yeah. when I've not been doing Japanese, doing kidney, kidney six. And as soon as she, she got off the bench, she actually could feel that her voice was clearer. Right. And she stood up straighter. 
And it suggests something interesting right enough about, okay, so you're saying she loses, she has her voice changes during her periods, which yeah. suggests that she's doing some, she's losing that part where that straw comes through the abdomen, gets mucked up in, yeah. with her period, that the loss of voice, because she clearly, the loss of voice, she can say it, it, it's either hormonal <clears throat> or something to do with the period in yeah. some, uh, maybe not hormonally, so we're just, I'm just suggesting maybe, you know, if the voice got better. But you know, so you bring you a good point. So they say kidney sticks good for the throat, and now our challenge is to say, why do we say that? So if I'm activating kidney sticks, I can see that it's going to end in the throat, which is what, where the kidney channel ends, by the way. Okay, the kidney channel circles the throat. That's how it ends. So. We have to find these connections. Otherwise, it becomes all theory, and how do we know how to apply it? Okay, does that make sense? So, um, we were, oh, so, from, so I have this prayer called kidney six. Then what, what's the next area we felt where, you know, yes, you can say your perineal floor. I mean, ultimately, I'm reaching for the perineal floor, to have a lift in the perineal floor. Uh, I don't think needling REN1 is quite what we all want to do. Okay, so we can let go of that. Okay. So the next area we felt is really between the legs, sort of liver 9 area. But if I take liver 9 and go to the kidney channel, we have a point that we call uh, inner yin. Okay. So uh, like we say five fingers above kidney 10. Okay. But it's basically you go to liver 9 and just drop to, to the kidney channel. Oh, you look at me strange. Liver 9, I find I just slide until I, it stops because of the musculature. It's just the nature of the liver 9. Okay. And then, I have, so I have kidney 6, I have inner yin, and then I need something to, to represent those two hands that... Okay. If you're going to lift someone, okay, if I do, you know, I, so I know I'm going to do this, but if I do this, nothing's going to happen, okay? But if I do this, well, she's sitting, it's a lot hard for me to lift her up. Well, you better be a ballerina, and it really works. But, no, you, but, you know, I mean, look, look at any sort of ballet dancers, you know. Your easier lift is from here. It's, you can do it from under the ribs as well, but once you get above the, you know, above the lower ribs, it's going to be a lot harder to lift someone. It's, yes, it's possible. You can go to Chinese circuses and they can lift somebody from weird places. I mean, you could pick someone up here. Yes, a lot of things can happen. But the most convenient place to lift is from the hips. Just because, well, there's a lot more bone there. You know? So I have a point. Be, if you take REN4, go all the way to the side okay, from REN4. And people say, is that similar to gallbladder 26? Yes, but it's been way below gallbladder 26. It's about three percent below, okay? Because mm -hmm. red forest, I believe, three percent below um, the navel. All the way to the side, it's below the iliac crest. It's in the glute meat, okay? That sends an upward, okay? So uh, it, you can call this point mushu, okay? It's between the mu and the shu, okay? Or, you know, you can say this is gallbladder 27, 28, okay? Uh, because the gallbladder channel could conceivably go straight down. It doesn't have to do this. It depends on the period. There are some periods where the gallbladder channel is not described as exactly the same way, okay? So you can say gallbladder 27, 28, uh, which I called, by the way, wushu, the five pivots, okay? Um, so, so supporting the body. Or you can uh, call it uh, uh, Wei Dao, okay, to link, okay, to link the body. So this area of the glute medius allows you to support the body upwards, okay. And finally, you, you'll get to the throat, so either stomach nine. Sometimes I find people have a lot of tension under the teeth. What happens if you, if you have nothing in your legs? You're going to want to hold yourself up from somewhere. You're going to do it somewhere around here, right? So it could be in the throat, could be just under the teeth. Or the other option is uh, bladder two, I might use. So this is like a, a clinical protocol that I use to 
create a lift or extension in a body. And I use that a fair amount because a lot of people come and they're like this. Okay. And where they're going to fall, they're going to fall at a T the T12 area is going to sink back and down. You'll see that very common in lots and lots of patients, which is why T11, T12 is so important, in my opinion. Okay? It's not just that it's the spleen, stomach, shoe area. Okay? So, um, there is a character, when they describe the channels in the Ling Shu, okay, there is a character called, um, by name of Chuai, Okay, Chui means to, it's not, it's similar in a way to Chow, okay, because Chow has the same, Chow is also to do this, the, the Chow channels, you know, Yin Chow, Yang Chow. This has the character of the foot. It's the specialty of the foot, that's what ch uh, Chui means, okay. This character here, you can see, you can, when you're looking at analyzing, I know this looks like a mountain, but that's not really what it's meant up here. It's meant going upwards and going downwards, something that grows up and down. So it describes the same exact thing. That in order to stomp, okay, if you just stomp like this, it's like, it's not a really, stomping has an upward, it's sending down to bring up. And that character exists in the spleen channel, the kidney channel, and the bladder channel. It says, you know, that as, as describes the channel, when it talks about it, the channel somewhere between the foot, once it leaves the foot and moves upward, it says that it stomps, the channel stomps, okay? So those are channels that are going to be important to look at in order to create this lift. And one more point that I want to bring up is bladder 36, okay? So as you're sitting on your chairs, what I'd like you to do is, well, you probably won't have to do this because you're probably already doing that, is sit on your buttocks. No, no, no. Sit on your glutes. Okay, I feel what that feels like, right? It feels like, hey, man, you don't have another joint. <laughs> now, lift yourself up with your hands and sit on your thighs. Don't sit on your butt. Sit on your sit bones. Most of you interpret that sit on your butt means sit on your sit bones. Now, what does it feel like? Hmm? Yeah, and you don't need that joint anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a little less, it's a little less schleppy, okay? So it creates some energy in you. It creates some fluff. But it's, it's very grounding, but it's giving you lift at the same time. Yes, when exactly. you sit on your sit bones, it's like another pair of feet, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, and It's like a second pair of feet. Now, watch most of your patients. Most of, okay, so for example, you do not have your heels on the ground right now. And it's not because you, your legs are too short. Come a little bit further on the chair. I'm not far enough forward in my exactly. chair. Exactly. Yeah. But most people, it's our habit. Mm. You'll see patients and they're like, they're almost pointing their feet because they're, you know, they're creating all this tension, they're not grounding. Mm. So that's one of the big things, especially people with all sorts of pain issues. I just say to them, can you send your heels down to the floor? Some people can because it's too short. I mean, but they have to be really short. Most chairs are there. And suddenly when, when their heels are touching the ground, oh, my pain's gone. I mean, it's very common. That I, now, it doesn't mean it's gone forever, but you're giving them a tool to be able to manage the pain by sending your legs down. Okay, so this is not just theory for acupuncture. This is something that you want to be able to apply, you know, teach people to apply in regular life. Okay, you'll be surprised how many people come to you and when you're talking to them, besides the fact they may cross the legs, etc., but they're like this. You know, they, you know, they, they, of course my, my heels reach the ground, but it's convenient, I, this is my habit. So can you send the legs down? And we'll see, in a, we'll do something about liver four also. You know, I, I know it's not a popular point to TCM, for example, but liver four is a very important point. Okay, so this issue of the try, the down to create an, an up, is extremely important for me. Okay, and bladder thirty six is one of the pivots on of it, and I know it's kind of weird to talk about bladder thirty six in terms of shin shin issues, but you'll be amazed how it does come into play, 
And the name of it is called support the support. Okay, it's a double support. Okay, to receive the support or to support the support. Okay, so it's an incredibly important point. Okay, and extremely well ignored. Okay, <laughs> I get that it's not the most convenient <coughs> point to needle either. I mean, there are worse points to needle, but really, bladder 36, you know, you just go, you lift, lift their shorts a little bit and, you know, and it can be more medial, could be more lateral, and sometimes, if, especially for musculoskeletal issues, I'll do three or four of them. Um, you know, and Kawhi used to use a point just below, like, you know, two fingers below, because, well, you know, it's a lot more modest to do that. But the, my main point is that it doesn't have to be the center. I think if you're getting the attachment of the hamstring, you're better off than getting it, you know, getting it a little lower. But if that's what's most comfortable for you, that's okay. Okay. The um, point below it, 37, okay, is called yin men, an abundance of yin. Okay, um, so, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, not abundance, sorry. Uh, and uh, the gate of abundance, okay, so uh, I, I'm just, yin, it, yin is always yin, no matter what we do, <laughs> so this yin means lots of abundance, okay, so yin men is the name of, um, of uh, bladder 37, so you can see that again, same sort of, you know, same sort of idea that if you get through that gate to creating lots, then maybe you can, you can extend also. But I think that quite honestly, 36 is way more powerful in my opinion. Okay, so that's kind of to give you some background of my, my ideas. Okay, now the okay, so the next thing to look at is in what I do. I tend to look at the body, and I tend to die. I don't die. This is okay. People will often say, "Oh, this style you diagnose from the body. You palpate abdomen and you find certain pressure pain areas, and then you fix them. You make all that pressure pain disappear." But that's like a standard way that people see this style. That is not totally correct. It looks like that. My diagnosis comes partially from the body. My diagnosis primarily comes from the medical history. Okay? The body either confirms the medical history or gives me some more ideas. The reason I'm constantly palpating is to do confirmation. Because you can have an idea and you can say, oh, this person, it's their thyroid and that got everything screwed up and therefore if I treat the thyroid, everything should be okay. So you do your best points for thyroid and nothing moves, okay? Because you have to check that your thyroid points, not just sticks, let's say, first of all, do they show something in the thyroid? If they show something in the thyroid, then you can say, okay, maybe it is the thyroid, but if they show nothing, that already makes the theory a little less likely. People can have thyroid issues and not show pressure pain around stomach line. It's possible, absolutely, okay? But it makes it a little less likely. And then let's say they, they do or they do not have pressure pain on stomach line, but let's say whatever they have in the abdomen, if I try to fix the, the thyroid and it fixes the ab, let's say they came for shoulder pain, okay? And they have, we're just inventing, they have uh, pressure pain on REN12 and pressure pain on right stomach 26. Just inventing something, doesn't mean anything. I want to treat the thyroid. Thyroid for me belongs in the kidney category. Okay. Does not belong like in TCM, uh, in spleen chi deficiency or heart fire or anything of that nature. It's in for me. It's in the kidney category. Okay. I now press. I'm trying to. If I press on the kidney point, and it fixes stomach nine area. That's the thyroid side. And it fixes. They had pressure pain on REN12, and now they say, oh, nothing. And they have pressure pain on right stomach 26, 27. They say, oh, nothing. And now I say, and how's the shoulder? And they say, oh, great. That tells, that confirms that the thyroid is at the, at the root of the problem. Okay? So all I'm doing is I'm using the body to confirm my thinking. And then it can say, oh, your thinking is bullshit. <laughs> like, make up another story. So always making up a story, a diagnostic story, 
is, you know, you'll see it when we have a patient. I'm always running around from story to story trying to confirm it, and that's what gets very confusing in the start. Okay? There is no one diagnosis. It keeps shifting. Okay? The diagnosis and the treatment are totally intertwined, and the treatment dictates the diagnosis just as much as the diagnosis only partially dictates the treatment. Okay? Usually we say you have to have appropriate diagnosis in order to have a treatment strategy. Here I'm having a partial diagnosis. When I'm treating, I'm confirming or disconfirming the diagnosis. If I confirmed it, treating meaning I pressed on a point, I didn't needle it. When I confirmed my diagnosis, I can now needle and treat. So the treatment confirms the diagnosis or not. Okay? Think about it this way. You go to a doctor and they say, you, you're, all your symptoms come because you have a left ventricular or blah, 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 blah. Well, let's do a valve replacement. Okay? Now, the problem, okay, let's take something a little easier. You don't have to cut open the chest. <laughs> your whole, you have uh, appendicitis. You know, again, you have to cut, but it's not you. Recovery is much faster. They take out the appendix. If your symptoms didn't go up, didn't get better eventually, they were wrong, right? The diagnosis was wrong. Maybe you had an appendix, you know, some appendix problem, but it did not solve the problem. So the diagnosis was wrong. We have to be willing to be wrong in our diagnosis. How do we know we were right or wrong? Was our treatment, you know, did the job or not? It's the only way to know. You know, because we don't have x-rays. We, I don't have blood tests to say, okay, you took this medication, and look, now your blood is much better. Yeah, but I'm still feeling like hell. Okay, it's, it's like you... Just because the, the diagnostic tools show up clean, if the person's still complaining, that it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter, because the only thing that matters, you know, is that the person's not feeling quite right. Okay, so for me, if... I can get rid of the abdominal findings, it tells me that I'm on the right path. But it, at the end of the day, it has to be the patient's symptom. It has to get better. Otherwise, I have the most wonderful diagnosis. It doesn't mean anything. Okay? And we have to be very careful about that because we all get caught in our beautiful diagnoses. You know, it's, it's very attractive to be able to, to classify things. Okay? So, I use the body, I press on the body, I try and press, I should be able to get my fingers in up to one knuckle in, okay, without pain, okay. If they start going, ugh, before, I mean, up to one knuckle, it's not like, you know, it's less than an inch, okay. So it's relatively mild, but it's not totally on the surface, okay. If, when I press, they say there's something here, that's significant. Okay, so I just classify it and I'm going, okay, they have pressure pain in this area, this area, this area, this area. I collect all, these I call my reflexes. Okay, so I collect my, all the reflexes on this patient. I know what their medical history is because I've talked to them or I've looked at the paper. And now I'm starting to correlate the two things together to come up with a strategy. Okay? And now I'm saying, oh, I, according to the strategy, this point should be good, this point should be good, etc., etc. Okay, make sense? So, here are reflexes that relate to the autonomic nervous system are, are likely to show in the body in shen disturbance or psychospiritual issues. Okay, so, first of all, the spine. Okay, that's pretty obvious, and especially the upper spine. T2 to T7, but that relates to the autonomic nervous system. But T11, T12, because so many people are sinking, and T11, T12 is going to be like sinking and falling back, not just down. Down would be this. If I'm falling just down, I'm basically compressing my lumbar. But if I'm falling back, which is what most people do, I'm not going to be in the front, I'm going to be in the back. And you, you see the slots. Okay, so you need to somehow lift T11, T12 upwards. And the point outside the spleen shoe is called Yi Shi. Okay, the, the, the residence of the Yi. Okay? The Yi is very important in, in Shen issues because the Yi is actually the expression, it's the words of the heart. 
Okay? So the spleen is actually, for me, much more important, the yi is much more important than the liver, for me, okay, in Shen issues. Okay? You're going to have, the neck is going to show, they're going to show pressure pain either on the SCM, which controls the vagus nerve, or is on top of the vagus nerve, or around the cervicals. That's very, very typical. Some of them will have scalenes that are tight. Okay? They're breathing muscles, so they relate to the autonomic nervous system. Okay. So either the SCM or the scalings or the cervicals are going to show on people with autonomic nervous system, possibly, or it's likely. Another area in the next, the occiput. You know, the occiput has, you know, in TCM it's called the wind area. Wind meaning disturbances. It's not just wind that comes from the outside. It's also wind. I don't mean internal wind as in, you know, uh, epilepsy or something, but the, like the mind is going like this. This is the area that guards your mind in a way, okay? So if you, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of harder exercise to do, but so maybe we'll do it later, but you know, if you, if you look at people who are like this, you know, if you talk to meditators, okay, one of the things, one of the instructions in meditation is tuck the chin slightly in. Why? Because if I'm like, if, if I'm meditating, I'm like that. Does that look like to you like I'm? Oh man, I'm in a real samadhi here. <laughs> Not exactly, because I'm my head's thrown back. I know it looks like it's forward, but what's really thrown back is the head. The neck is forward. Okay, so I'm, it's actually like this. Okay, so obviously there is not a lot of easefulness if the head is thrown back. You have to lengthen this area of say GB20. Okay. And this area is, you know, like we, we have this um, point, an mian, the, the, the peaceful sleep point, okay? This relates to the ability of releasing the nervous system, okay? Then we have the chest, the chest, obviously, because the diaphragm, I mean, as everybody knows, you don't have to exercise, well, maybe some of us do, but to, that if I activate the diaphragm, the nervous system calms down. Okay. It's pretty obvious if you have a tight diaphragm, the nervous system is going to be tight. It's, you know, the, the shen is not going to be happy if the, the diaphragm is tight. What's the first thing you tell somebody who's uptight? Yeah. Breathe. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you know, you, it just open up the diaphragm. Okay. It's, it has to happen, otherwise everything is locked. Okay. The next area is your eyes are an area of perception. We see with our eyes, and pain is a perception, and mental, any, any mental issue is a perception. So whatever points around the eye, but for me, bladder two is like probably the, the most um, obvious one that I, that I use. Okay? But eyes are really important, and it can also be a reflection. You don't have to necessarily treat from there. Uh, the Oxford we talked about, but it has to do with rest and weight. Sacrum has a parasympathetic plexus there. Okay, so if your sacrum is all held, you go, you know, the, you know, it's like I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'll show you, the, I don't know if you can see the difference. Additionally, I'm sticking my chest out and I'm tight, I'm, this is, I'm tightening my sacrum, my sacroiliac um, ligaments. It creates much more tightness in the rest of my body than if I just stick my chest, sticking my chest out or something. Big deal. But if I'm tightening the, the sacrum, then all the tightness in the diaphragm that happens is, is much more severe. Okay? So it's very important to look at the sacrum and the psoas, the inner thigh. So if you look, um, I know it's a lot more popular now, so people, I think people can relate to it now, you know, in, because they have all these uh, theories and post-stress um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever, whatever it is, that you know has to do with the psoas, and there's all sorts of release techniques for that. If you look at an animal, if you look, okay, if I ask you, where is your core? What are you going to say? Most of you are going to think it's somewhere around your navel, okay? And you're going to go to do pilates to try and get a six-pack, okay? <laughs> but that's not your core. Your core is actually kind of between your legs a little bit more. It's more in your pelvic floor and your psoas. If you look at an animal, okay, that's being chased by, you know, like a giraffe being chased by a lion, if you like those nature shows or things like that, you see that when the predator, 
the, the guy that's running after you, okay, is about to get you. What you do is, at that, some point, you, you just stop running and you freeze. And that freezing comes from here. In the same way that when you leap, it also comes from here. When you're going to run, you're going to have to have this activated. You, you can't run just with your feet. You've got to run with your hips. Okay, otherwise you running is like you, you know, like little kabuki theater woman running. You know, you, you've got to run with your feet from here. Okay, from this area. And the same thing when you freeze, it all freezes here. And the purpose of that is this contraction basically freezes the nervous system because, you know, if you're about, about to be eaten by a cat, okay, you do this. I mean, some people say, oh, yes, there is this thing, the, the mouse plays dead, so the cat will leave it alone. Um, but that, I think that's just for modern cats that don't eat the mice. They just play with the mice. The old cats used to. No, no, I mean, you know, before there was cat food, the, the cat really did eat the mouse. You know, and they were taught to do that by their mother. The mouse is basically freezing, and that shuts down their nervous system. Because if you're about to be eaten by a lion, better you, don't feel, better you feel less than feel more. So this is what shuts down the nervous system. So it, it's just like a core. If you're looking like at a core for a nuclear engine or something, you know, when the core shuts down, everything shuts down. Okay, that's why we call it a core. So a core is the, the center of activity. But the other thing to learn from it is a core should be empty. A core, like if you look at, at, at an atom, in the core, there, there is a sort of open spaciousness. Okay, so something to learn from that also, that it's, it's a quality that we want. Okay? So these are reflexes that we're going to see in what we call shen disturbances, okay? or likely reflexes. I'm not guaranteeing that every single one of them exists. Okay? So two more things. I told you liver is not of my greatest concern. My greatest concern is the up-down, is the chuan that exists in the body. Okay? And, um, <clears throat> look at the spleen. Okay? Two things. If you're going to look at it philosophically, well, yes, the spleen has the character chuai. The character yi, which belongs to the spleen, right? The yi, the intention, belongs to the spleen. Okay? It is the sound of the heart. Okay? So it expresses, the spleen is the way the heart, the emotions get expressed. Okay? Without um, intention without awareness, you don't suffer. Okay? Like, you can cut off my arm, but if I'm not aware, I don't suffer. That's the purpose of anesthesia, for example. Okay? But just in general, it's the spleen that's always kind of come in all these emotional issues because there's an awareness. I, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. That I am not happy comes from the spleen. Okay, and I know it sounds a little odd in the TCM world where there's been so much emphasis on liver, but that awareness of something is wrong is the spleen, because th the spleen is the thinking, correct? Okay, so the spleen becomes very important. Now, and the spleen, if you're looking at it a little more philosophical, you know, from a channel perspective and trying to make the, the this and the spleen is the only channel that says enters the center of the heart, besides the heart channel itself. Even the pericardium does not. Okay, the pericardium connects with a network around the heart. Okay, but the spleen and the heart both connect with the, what they call the center of the heart. Okay. So always look at the spleen. Now I will tell you, spleen three is called Tai Bai. Okay. Re again, I'm, I'm relating it to the uprightness. Okay. So um, if you if you want to make a name for my style of acupuncture, please do not call it Avi style. <laughs> Besides the fact that many people will get very pissed off, <laughs> but also because my style should be called upright style. <laughs> okay. Because that's the thing that concerns me the most. That the, the way we manipulate between up and down. Okay? And by the way, I didn't, this is not an invention of mine. I remember Miriam Lee once said, 
um, she said she, she went to get a degree, you know, a, a doctor of oriental medicine, and so she was supposed to write a thesis, blah, blah, blah. So, of course, everybody knows Miriam Lee, you know, it's like, well, of course she was going to get her, her diploma. No matter, even she never wrote a thesis, it really doesn't matter. She was like a big founding of, um, of Chinese medicine in, in America. Um, and all the sort of the Richard Tan styles, the Master Tong styles, they're all related, you know, she did not invent Master Tong style, but it all, all this um, promotion of, of those Taiwanese styles came from Miriam Lee. So Miriam said, so she went to the committee and she goes and they want her, you know, she's supposed to defend her thesis, so she says, that the yin goes down, clear yang goes up. And they all go, clap, and here's your diploma. They don't wait for anything else. It's the, and of course, you know, it's a political statement, but the point is, this, it also tells you that this idea of coordinating up and down in the body is, is worth your PhD kind of thing. It's a very important concept. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And that's kind of what, what I keep doing. Spleen 3 is called Tai Bai. Okay, Tai is great. Bai is officially white. But white is what, why is it white? It really shows the sun at dawn as the sun is rising. That's when everything is bright, it's white. That's literally what that character by shows. It's the sun with an extra stroke, like the sun is rising. So spleen three, the activation of spleen three also gives you an uprightness, okay? This is part of that shui that exists in the spleen, in my opinion. This is all interpretations. I can, not, none of this is written in the Ling Shu. We have to kind of make up what, what would do we think these classics are supposed to mean for us. Okay? So spleen three is very important, but there are other spleen points that can be very important for, for psycho-spiritual issues, but spleen three tends to be the big one. Okay? The other one is don't forget the Sun Zhao. And this is interesting because we tend to think of the Sun Zhao having to do with water metabolism. I mean, I, nobody really knows what the Sun Zhao is about. Okay. But no, I mean, because this, but clinically speaking, okay, do you really need a Sun Zhao points to get, to get rid of water? I mean, in TCM, I doubt it, you know, but that's what it's supposed to do. Or do you need a Sun Zhao points to, to warm up the body? Three heaters, I'm not, you know. The three heaters are three spaces. So first of all, those three heaters, supposedly, you know, like, you know, they have these beautiful pictures of, uh, like, you know, you, you want to eat the rice at the top or something, you know, like the steaming, that's what the three jowls are supposed to represent, you know, but in when they really show it that way. Um, they basically represent three diaphragms. You have your lower jaw from your perineal diaphragm. That has, there has to be some lift in the perineal diaphragm. And I understand that for most of us, it's a little hard to find that lift. That's why I started from the feet. Okay. Then you have, between the middle jaw and the, uh, the lower jaw and the middle jaw, there's really no clear diaphragm. But between the middle jaw and the upper jaw, there is, a, there is the diaphragm. And then between the upper jaw and the rest of the body, just like between the rest of the body and the lower jaw, there's a perineal diaphragm, there is the vocal cord diaphragm. There is kind of a diaphragm here. You can constrict this. So for example, if you do what's called ujjayi breath, I don't know if you can hear that, but you know, you're supposed to be able to hear like the, the, the wave between your ears. It's a constriction of the throat to actually create space in, in the throat, okay? And that's very calming. It calms the nervous system. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different methods of doing this kind of breath to calm down the nervous system, basically opening up the vagus nerve, okay? So you have one diaphragm, two diaphragms, three diaphragms, okay? They are related to the three jowls. But the other thing is the three jowls are three places where people, where would pe you say, okay, you're anxious. Where do you feel your anxiety? In my gut. In my stomach or in my chest. That's the three typical. You, they can say in my throat. It's not all that abnormal. But those are three. So I think part of the idea of the three jowls is that these are three spaces, three places of anxiety. And the character itself of jowl, and this is a bird at the top, and this is fire. Okay? You're roasting a bird. Okay? Therefore, the bird, you know, it also, jiao also means to be anxious, to be worried. Okay, we, there's a big advantage when you see the Chinese and you can actually automatically read it. <coughs> Not to me, by the way. 
but you know, we have a huge disadvantage that we're kind of interpreting, you know, and that we're not understanding that the people who made up this stuff probably saw 20 different connotations that we just don't see. And they see it immediately, so they kind of like, oh, yeah, that's Sanja, oh, yeah, it has to do with anxiety. It's like, we're like, we learned Sanja, water metabolism, and like, why anxiety? We have to go back and re explain it. Okay? So, if you're a bird that's going to be on a fire, you're going to be anxious too. Okay? <laughs> I don't think that that chicken on the whatever, you know, rotisserie. Spit. Hmm? Spit. Yeah, I don't know, the shish kebab the places, whatever. I think that I would be pretty anxious if I was on them. <laughs> okay? So, that it relates to. Um, you know, anxiety. So the Sanjiao by theory right there and then, and I can tell you, I'll show you, the Sanjiao channel releases the throat, releases the nervous system. It's a very powerful channel because of that. It's, so they never forget the Sanjiao. So I'm wondering if this would be a good time for a quick break and then actually do something more practical because I think I'm assuming this is like a little overwhelming for those of you who are totally new. Is this correct? Just I want to get some feedback to know where where you're at. Makes sense so far. You're okay. All right, all right. Um, so we'll do a little bit of a demo. I won't do a real treatment, but I want to demonstrate it a little bit. There's the difference for me between a demo and a treatment. Demonstration is I'm trying to show you something in a treatment. I'm not trying to show you anything. I'm treating the person and I'm showing you what I'm doing. So the patient is in control, not the subject of the class. Okay, there's a big difference. So when, when I'm demonstrating, I'm really wanting you to do. I'm demonstrating mechanics. Okay, so why don't we take about a five-minute break? I'm sure we'll turn into ten, but <laughs> we'll try and make it five. So, yes, but hold on, Lawrence. It's a very quick one. Yes. Quite a lot of the patients that come um, have this inversion in the temperature where the below the navel is is cold and it gets. Warmer. Is that a fairly reliable reflex for, as it, I think you say, it's related to that the diaphragm? That should be, re could be, I don't know if it's a reliable reflex for the diaphragm, but one of the things that could happen is it could be, a, there's something in a, in a Japanese culture, there's something called hyper state of the diaphragm, the diaphragm is tight, and if the diaphragm is too tight, then the upward, downward motion of um, can be disrupted. Uh, but it could come from other situations, but one of the typical things of, of a cold uh, abdomen but warm chest is a tight diaphragm. So I, I was trying to say, can you... Do, is, is it reliable? That, that's like ANS disorder straight away because you... No, no, you can't, no, I can't, no, I can't say that. I can't yeah. say that warm, uh, warm chest but cold abdomen is an automatic ANS, but it's, it's highly possible that it is. Yeah. Is that fair? You know, I think there could be other possibilities. It all dep it, it just depends on other, uh, yes. you know, what else is going on. But it's not all that automatic. You know, like, you can say, pressure on kidney 2 automatically puts you on adrenal. That maybe it really doesn't, but that's the dogma. We say, you have pressure pain on kidney 2, then you, you, it's an adrenal exhaustion. So, um, you know, what we say below kidney 16, 4 o'clock, you know, that symptom of, you know, cold here, warm here, you know, it, I, I would not call it ANS absolute, but very likely, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Clumpet sensation um, can often be associated with that anxiety, this, this of course. Mm. tension in the throat. And very often we would look, be looking at the liver. Uh, aspect of constraint, <laughs> and you don't. So I'm just as it as part of this, and it's part of the upper jaw, this throat jaw, would it be? So where would we look well, at it? Well, the problem is here with jaw. Okay, so the problem is the jaw, the upper jaw, kind of ends here. So this is beyond. This is the the fourth jaw. <laughs> it's beyond the jaw, I guess. I mean, the, but okay. Here's the issue. You have three jaws. One, lower, middle, upper. Yeah. But you have three dantians. Lower, including the middle jowl. Middle, which is the upper jowl. And upper dantian. Okay. So you can have different me methods of looking at threes in the body. Okay. Don't limit yourself just to the jowl. Sorry, the I thought you mentioned jowl. that the throat is no, no, no. incorporated in this. With the the upper, the no, no, there's three diaphragms. This is oh, the, the diaphragm, the, that's it. This just like the perineal diaphragm is the between the body, the rest of the body, 
and the first jowl. This is between the rest of the body and the the, yeah. the neck is a is like a category on its own. Okay, because if it's just it's not so convenient when it's there <laughs> to to draw. Look evolutionarily. Okay, when does the neck happen? Okay, if you're looking, if you we are assuming that we all came from the ocean, and we came from amoeba first or something, and then well, we were in the ocean, and then it became, um, is it amphibians? Uh, the, the, the dinosaurs are amphibians? Reptiles. The reptiles, okay. Who are the amphibians? Frogs. <laughs> yeah, I think it's either. Yeah, it's okay, and then they split into birds, and then you get the mammals, okay? It's the mammals and the birds that get the neck. The fish and the reptiles don't. Okay? So the neck... Reptiles don't have... You're not a neck, reptile. I think the bronchosaurus might argue with you. Sorry, who? The bronchosaurus might argue with you. Oh, I don't... <laughs> don't know him personally. <laughs> I'll go to Jurassic Park and have a little bit of chat. No, okay. But, okay, I'm thinking of snakes. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the reptiles that we, you know, no, it, it's true because like, um, no, you're right, because for example, um, turtles have necks mm -hmm. and they're considered mm -hmm. reptiles, right? Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, but I think that the classic reptile and certainly the classic fish do not have neck and that starts with birds and mammals, mm -hmm. that's more typical. Okay, of neck. Now, it, it, obviously, there can be more developments than that. The neck is the, the place that s creates the situation where you have a separation from the brain and the body, and something needs to connect it. And it starts mm -hmm. being the brain that connects it. Now, it doesn't mean it's the only thing, because you can say the whole spinal system, it, you know, that I don't want to create like too much dogma around it. But so the neck, you know, in, okay, you have one, one two, three, four limbs. And you kind of have like a fifth limb here, okay? And as an acknowledgement of that in, in, in the Ming Shu, it talks about the, the, the five shoe points, okay, of all the channels. And then it starts talking about the, the point in the neck, what the words that people call the, the windows of the sky, okay? So it, and it, there's another, by the way, it, it's a concept that appears twice. It, it, it's a, it's also appears in the Suen, and I can't remember which chapter it is. Um, but twice it, it starts enumerating these points, and it, one of those places it's doing it while it's talking about, you know, the meridian, you know, the shoe points of the meridians, the transport, the movement point of the meridian. So there's a clear movement capacity in the neck. And for me, the understanding is because it connects the brain and the body, and it has this movement capacity for the nervous system. That's my kind of interpretation of it. So, uh, but yeah, so plum pitchy would be a typical anxiety issue. For me, I would look in more towards the triple warmer for that. Um, but it, again, it could be also kidney because, you know, like you, you were talking about, the kidney clearly relates to the throat, not because they say in the book kidneys relate to the throat, which is, you know, granted it says that, but because we can demonstrate it. So that, that's what I would look at. But yes, it definitely has to do with a stuckness in another diaphragm. You know, you, if you have one diaphragm that's weird, look at the other diaphragms. They're going to relate to each other. Whatever the perineal diaphragm does, or the... the um, the, the breathing diaphragm does, or the vocal cord diaphragm does, they'll each affect each other. They'll, they'll, mirror, they'll, they'll create effects on each other. You can treat one for the other. Thank okay. you. So your more, most typical um, concept of that is, well, there's two of them that, you know, protocol-wise that you see. You can treat stomach 9 for stomach 31 area, or kidney 11 area problems. That's one. And the other ones you can treat gallbladder 27, 28 on the inguinal, not the side ones, to release the, the liver. Okay? Mm. So, any other questions yeah. before we break? Okay. Yes. I've sorry. got one, but it's not related to this topic. That's okay. Um, I've just seen quite a few people where if you scrape the skin, you get the wheels coming out. The so wheels? You, we, um, what do you call them? Wheels. Wheels, yeah, we call them wheels. Uh, if you scrape something, like you basically get a raised lump. 
So oh, okay. there's, a, there's an immune thing going on. And I just wonder whether you have any insight into that. It's a in a particular place you, when you scrape them, or anywhere? Well, it's, 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 it's one guy in particular. Um, he's got loads of stuff going on, and he palpates. You can see where your fingers have been, because they actually come up and raise wheels. And that's, you might be allergic to me, but I, I think it's <laughs> a, a systemic thing. <laughs> well, I'm sure there, there's a child's uh, <laughs> definition in the dictionary for that. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It is, you know, I, I know what you mean. It, mm. don't, it's raised, but it, it's almost like it's, it's puffy, but it's empty. Yes. Okay, it's, it's almost like the skin went up and, and, and there's a little bit of air in there. Like a nettle rash or something like that. Yeah. Just from scratching. I pressure. would say it, those things, they could be immune, but they could be a nervous system. Okay. A lot of allergies, by the way, are related more to the nervous system than to the immune system. The nervous system can't take something and activate. The immune system doesn't necessarily get activated first. It gets activated through the nervous system. The nervous system is going to go, ugh, ugh, ugh. And then the immune system attacks it. But the, okay, remember that yes. the immune system, the adrenal system, which is, we know, what, what do you do? People have wheels, do you call them? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, well, oh, well, it's okay. Um, this is a little different, <laughs> I think, from what I'm putting in. But anyway, um, the adrenal, the um, autonomic nervous system, and the immune system are all highly correlated. One, one will drag the other. Okay? If you always, if you have very weak immunity, okay, you're always fighting a cold or some, you know, you're always like weak immunity on some level or another, you're going to have to draw on your um, adrenals at some point. And when you draw new and and you will always a, a, and you will eventually also draw on your um, nervous system. It's going to drain the. It's, it's going to piss off the nervous system. So it's making less smooth because you're always like <sighs> like this. And the other way around, people have non-smooth nervous systems that don't adjust easily mm. with their nervous system. I don't mean like they're pissed off or anything. But they just don't. They're always not adjust. For example, there's there are people. I'm for example. Way too hot, way too fast, at a ver fairly normal temperature for most people. Way cold when the, and no, nobody, everybody else is just like, I'm fine with a sweater. I'm like, where's the heat? <laughs> you know, I have a very narrow range of temperature c capacity. When the temperature changes, my hands freeze. Doesn't matter if it's, it's hot today, but yesterday was cold, colder. The temperature change, all my patients are going, well, your hands are freezing. It's, it's warm outside. How is it possible your hands are freezing? My hands freeze when the temperatures change one, one way or the other because my nervous system has not adjusted. And the nervous system <coughs> opens up blood vessels. Okay? So there are three systems, the nervous system, the adrenal system, and the immune system all correlate and drag each other. Once one of them is, is not doing well, the other two will eventually get dragged also. So sometimes allergies, while it is officially an immune response, it could have started with, and also a lot of these skin immune responses, what do you do? Prednisone. They're, they're hydro, uh, hydrochloric, uh, hydrochloric, prednisone, what? Cortisone. Cortisone, thank you. Cortisone is what, you know, all these cortisone creams, they're not for the immune system. Well, they suppress the immune system, but they're, you know, you can see how those those systems are related. The adrenals and the immune system are related, and the adrenals and the autonomic autonomic nervous systems, um, autonomic autonomic nervous system, are highly work together. So those three, you know, so it, I would not always call every allergy immediately an immune. It, the expression of it is in the immune system, but the mm. cause could be so in, in the autonomic nervous system. So someone who, like you press and they immediately, either immune mm -hmm. or autonomic nervous system, <coughs> it would be a, a suggestion to look at that. Sorry, now you said when they went like that. You saying also, I seem to recall that somewhere in uh, Kiko's book, and I'm sure she's mentioned it, when you, you know, when you just touch somebody back all of a sudden, they're very sensitive on one side of the back. Is that what, is that, would that be a similar sort of thing? Where they're I'm sensitive not sure to... about one side. Okay, I can't speak about one side of the back. I can tell you what I, what I can tell, what, 
I can tell you what I can tell you about one side of the bag. Two things. <laughs> Sorry, it didn't come out right. Um, left side could be spleen, and right side could be just liver. But it doesn't. But the, okay, there are the thing that I'm much more familiar with is the people that no matter where, almost no matter where in the spine, when you touch close to the spine, they jump. You know, some people, you, you try and find something and they're always like this. Yeah. Um, you know, they're fine on the abdomen, but when they're face down, it's very, it's, it's very difficult. For them. <coughs> they tend to be liver types. Yeah. You know, that I, I regardless of which side. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have a good dogma for science, yeah. but for the type that's highly sensitive when you poke on the back, that tends to be liver. If you needle, because it's at that point, you can still needle liver eight. If you needle liver eight, it calms down somewhat. It doesn't disappear 100% by needling liver eight. So I needle liver eight, and I try and do my best <laughs> with, with, with what they still have. But it calms it down generally. Does that answer? Yeah, that, that's the answer. Thank you. Are we eating until our tea break? So that's not the question. Um, <laughs> Did you get an extra question? question? I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of um, levity, and in terms of you know, yeah. connecting the ground to get levity. Right. Okay. But that seems very much a sort of central spinal thing. It you is. A corresponding kind of dissension on the outside. So I wonder whether it's seen as more of a... Um, a, 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 a um, a dynamic thing rather than just a, a, a levity from pressing down. You get this kind of subsequent, if you like, relaxation and dropping away from the yes. spine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's an interesting subject. Um, Next year. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this year. We'll talk about these points. Um, ah. The thing is, I, okay, I've generally tried to, have, I've, my whole life as an acupuncturist, I have shied away from too much scalp. Too much what? Sorry. Scalp. Scalp oh. points. Oh. And but because in the last few years I've been uh, talking to people who do Yamamoto and stuff, so I had to start looking at that a little bit more. And a friend of mine has also warned me that eventually we'll all be doing scalp points and no body points. That's where the culture is going. Um, and you you can see it. You can see that it's true. Um, so. Yeah, there is an effect, you know, because you, you, the way you talk, talk about it is an effect that's almost like going down, like oh, as if from do it's twenty. Like a fountain or something. Yeah, Absolutely. there is a certain effect, of, but and I, t in on my own body, I can only unfortunately. Now this is very interesting. This is the first time I'm teaching. I, I had a hip replaced, mm. and it's the first time I'm teaching since then, and I've always. I teach from my body, I'm thinking in my body, and I'm, when I'm working with people, I'm understanding everything has to be from my body. I'm not a, theor I'm not a good theoretical practitioner. I'm, that's under the con contradiction. I'm not someone who practices with theory. I have theory, but it has to be translated inside my body in order for me to be able to apply it. I'm one of those weird people. I'm wondering how that will change because now my body is different and I don't know what my capacity is going to be at, at the end of the day. <laughs> you know, I have no clue. So this thing of it coming down is something that in my own body I don't have a good uh, sense of it. Mm. The only sense of it I have is more from here, not from here. I don't have... And that's one of the reasons why I've avoided skull points, because I can't relate to them. I can't produce them in myself. It's very hard for me. For some people, that's where the brain is connected to, to their skull. My brain does not, my brain wants to connect in my hips and in my knees and my whatever. It does not want to, it doesn't connect here. You know, everybody's got places that they connect and don't connect. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're talking, so for example, um, people would ask me things about yin, um, yin chao yang chao, or yin wei yang wei. And I tell people often, and we'll, actually I'll show you, it, it's actually in here too. I relate to yin chao and I relate to yin wei, and I have no correlation, no capacity to relate at all to yang chao and yang wei. I, it, it's not my issue. I don't relate, and it's kind of funny because Jeffrey, at one point said, well, you know what, because he, 
He said, well, you, you, you're a yin chow type. And then he said, well, actually, no. The problem is you're actually yang chow. That's why you can't relate to it. <laughs> so it's hard to know what's really going on. And it's all how you want to make it up. But I'm just, it's clear to me that I've chosen a certain way of being able to relate to it. Because yin chow, yin chow is supposedly the person who always blames themselves. And yang chow is the person that always blames the world. I mean, these are you know weird you know, ways of classifying things, but you know it's just general. No blame, no nothing. It's just I mean, I, I use the word, but no, don't blame the person that they're doing. But actually, often the person that blames themselves that you know it's because they're actually blaming the world, but they won't. It's not it's not appropriate. <laughs> so they stick. Mm -hmm. So there's many ways to look at these things, and and it, it's the ability to open up and see this is going to be how flexible am I? to be able to do it. I don't have the flexibility. Mm. I haven't developed mm. an openness for certain kinds of things. Mm. Mm. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't understand this. <laughs> so, um, so this, I can talk to you about this. I don't know if I can talk about it. And I can even, uh, and I'll show you. I'll, I'll, when we talk about the eyes, I'll, I'll uh, the, the, remind me about that. Because there is something in the eyes that's going to relate to that. Okay. But from the top, it's like you're talking Greek to me. I think, I think, you know, I suppose I'm saying to yourself is from experience. So yeah, yeah. there's definitely something about when um, when you become more grounded and you get the uplift going, you do have that. I mean, it's just as simple as relaxation, actually. It's, oh, absolutely. And, and yeah. It's actually there's definitely a, a downward expression in terms of um, gravity and levity. I mean, yeah. No, no, I, I totally, I, mm. I totally understand what you're saying. On the one hand, on the other hand, that there's something that doesn't fully connect for me, and, and I'm not saying it's, it doesn't yes. exist. I, I, I am saying you have to have it down in order to relax, and you have to have it. It's a little bit like discipline and freedom. You can't have one without the other, because it's false without the other. Mm. You can't have, you know, it's. What was that song from the 70s or 60s or something? Uh, what comes up must go down, what goes down must go up, something like that. <laughs> I'm the opposite of the song. What, not what comes up must come down, it's what goes down will come up. <laughs> you know, and that, that principle. So yes, you can look at it, you can start it, okay. You know how some people, sorry, then we do a break. <laughs> you know how some people when, when they do Tai Chi and they talk, some people say, visualize, and I've literally seen different teachers do, do this, and I'm like, which one is it supposed to be? Well, either one, actually, when you're willing to let go. Some people will say, imagine it's going from the top down in the body in the back and coming up the front, and you know, and some people say, it comes down the front and up the back, and I'm like, oh, okay, wait, the other teacher says it. And eventually you go, like, it kind of doesn't matter, the front, the back, the body. <laughs> It's like the point is something is something is happening and whichever one works on your body and then you go to a teacher and they say, you know, when you do that when you're doing this, there's a break in whatever, and then you try and work out why why some part is broken is not part of this. And then maybe they say, Well, try and visualize and they're giving you the opposite visualization, and you oh, now this got integrated or something. So it's not like there's an absolute truth, because for another person, the exact opposite visualization will integrate that part. I don't think there's one universal Tai Chi principle of up and down. There's only a principle of an up and down. Where they are in the back, is it in the back or in the front, in the blah, blah? I don't know. I don't think it matters. That's just me. I, I don't teach Tai Chi or Chi, so it's not relevant. <laughs> so. Um, shall we break? Yes.